الله بالخير في جنوب أفريقيا لطالما لعب المسلمون دورا رئيسيا في النضال ضد نظام الفصل العنصري الأبرتايد حيث يتجاوز تأثيرهم عددهم الفعلي في سيرته الذاتية أن تكون مسلما يربط الباحث في الشؤون الإسلامية الجنوب أفريقي فريد إسحاق بين العقيدة الإسلامية وانتقاد الاستعمار والإمبريالية والهيمنة الغربية ويدعو إلى العدالة الاجتماعية والمساواة في الحقوق من هم مسلمو جنوب أفريقيا؟ وما مدى تأثيرهم؟ وما الذي يجمع بينهم وبين قضايا الأمة؟ كيف أثرت حركات التحرير الوطني الفلسطيني في مسار التحرر من الأبرتايد في جنوب أفريقيا؟ هل وفرت الديمقراطية المساواة لذوي البشرة السوداء في هذا البلد المتنوع الثقافات؟ وفي ظل تعرض النظام الدولي لتحديات جدية اليوم هل بات من الملح مراجعة دور الأمم المتحدة الإنساني؟ نرحب بكم ونرى ونسمع أكثر من ضيفنا الأستاذ فريد إسحاق رئيس مجلس إدارة حركة المقاطعة بي دي أس في جنوب أفريقيا في البعد الأقرب هذه الميادين وأنا زينب الصفار خليكم ويانا Professor Farid Isaac, South African Muslim scholar, author and political activist a veteran of the struggle against appetite Chairperson of BDS South Africa Board, served as a commissioner for gender equality with Nelson Mandela's government, an activist in the inter-religious solidarity movement for justice and peace. Professor Farid Izak, salam and welcome to Al Mayadeen. This is the proximate aspect. I'm Zainab Al Safar. Few pleasure to have you, sir. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Zainab. The pleasure is also mine to be with you. Most welcome, sir. Well, um, it is a fact that Muslims played a key role in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And to this day, their influence goes far beyond their actual number. Might you, sir, explain who are these Muslims and how do they relate to the universal ummah? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, firstly, South African Muslims, originally the first Muslims uh, came from the Indonesian archipelago. Today, Indonesia and Malaysia, and they were brought to South Africa as political exiles by the Dutch, uh, who was at the same time in control of Batavia and the Indonesian archipelago on the whole. So the more difficult uh, resistance leaders, um, and among them were kings, uh, who the Dutch felt that the influence had to be cut, uh, given how uh, formidable leaders they were against the Dutch occupation. And they were then exiled to uh, the Cape, which at that time was known Kaab Raqsa Ja'a Salih, the Cape of Good Hope. Mm -hmm. So that is the first generation of, of Muslims uh, in South Africa. And so they lived here as exiles and they lived as slaves. And the one remarkable thing is over this more than 360 years, 
they retained their identity. But not only did they retain their identity, they played a, a leading role in the communities where they were. Mm -hmm. For example, during one of the states of emergency that the apartheid regime declared, in the first one in the early 1980s, um, they had detained thousands of people. And when I systematically went through the list of the detainees, I found that 16% of the people on that list were Muslim. In the, in the first South African Democratic Parliament under Nelson Mandela, 12% of all the people in Parliament were Muslim. Our country's first Chief Justice was Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, our country's first Minister of Transport, Minister of Justice, um, Minister of uh, Minister of Science and Technology, our current Minister of, uh, of Finance, mm -hmm. our current Minister of International Relations, mm -hmm. uh, and a number of other deputy ministers are Muslim. Yes. Uh, allow me to ask you, sir, you reckon that all of us are forced by the context of September 11th to find a sort of moderate Islam, a beautiful Islam, a gentle Islam, as you term it. Not that Islam is not all of these. Uh, why should the context of occupation not force us to find an angry Islam? as you may uh, propose. Can Muslims express their anger against unjust socio-economic systems without being labeled as terrorists or uh, must they not? Well, um, I think we have a limited option into how we are being labeled. We have to ensure that we are not responsible ourselves for uh, inappropriate uh, or slanderous uh, labels. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, uh, we have two responsibilities. The first responsibility is uh, to resist, to resist oppression, to resist occupation of our lands, and to fight. And that responsibility we need to be unashamed of. Mm -hmm. The problem is often with the way in which we resist and our language of resistance. But in this sense, sir, you say there is a path between dehumanizing fundamentalism and fossilized traditionalism. This is a path of radical Islam committed to social justice, to individual liberty, and the quest for the transcendent who is beyond all institutional religious and dogmatic constructions great beautiful when you say dehumanizing fundamentalism and fossilized traditionalism i would appreciate sir if you explain elucidate and examine these nomenclatures these terms these jargons what is actually meant by dehumanizing fundamentalism and fossilized traditionalism and how could radical Islam be committed to social justice? When you say the word radical, uh, it is to be associated with something else. Okay, so, so on the one hand, there is this uh, group today uh, in the Muslim world who are largely regarded as fundamentalists. <clears throat> they don't self-ascribe as fundamentalists, because in, in, in the Islamic nomenclature, um, a fundamentalist is somebody who sticks to the, uh, to the usul of the deen, the, base, the basic principles of the deen. <clears throat> and to this extent, it is a requirement of all Muslims, of all Muslims to stick to the usul. Um, but the, in general language now, the fundamentalists are portrayed as the people who want to establish a political state in the world today. That's the first thing. And the second thing, by ever means, by whatever means possible, um, and that includes, you know, uh, Fetal or Jihad, Bistaif, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, 
the other category, uh, and they often confuse between the two, is the radical. Radical Muslims want a complete transformation of the socio-political balance that there is in the world and the moral foundations of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, in theory, there is really nothing wrong with being a Muslim radical. There is nothing wrong with being any kind of radical. If somebody says that, look, I am not happy only with giving charity whenever there is blood on our TV screens because of the Israelis bombing the Palestinian people. Then I rush to give charity. If somebody says, yeah, Habibi, uh, that's short-sighted. Mm -hmm. Not only should we give charity when we see the blood on our TV screens, we should always be giving charity. But more important than that, we need to give money to ensure the collapse of those who keep on throwing the bomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we, need an end. Mm -hmm. we need an end to the international regime that keeps on supporting that government that keeps on throwing the bomb and, and, and creates ethnic cleansing. We can't only provide houses once people's homes have been bombed uh, or demolished by bulldozers. Mm -hmm. So that is a radical approach. So that's saying, hey, oh. right. So that's your explanation, sir, of, of what it means to be a radical Muslim. It's not to be associated Absolutely. with with uh, with extreme terrorism and terrorism uh, whatsoever, but to be a full practiced uh, 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 Muslim. Um, I would true, right? Absolutely, but a Muslim with a radical outlook, I want to get also to the causes mm -hmm. of the injustice, not only the results of the injustice. Sure, a major South African street in Santon, Johannesburg, was named after the Palestinian freedom fighter Leila Khalid. How did the Palestinian liberation movement influence South Africans during their uh, liberation struggle? Well, firstly, it was the African National Congress. When the ANC was in exile, the South Africa was, along with a number of other countries, uh, it was Cuba, it was the Palestinians, um, uh, it, was, uh, the, it was a number of other entities, okay? And the ANC was in solidarity with them. They were in solidarity with South Africa. So this, on the one hand, a political relationship there. Secondly, uh, Israel, since it, uh, establishment and the Nakba um, was a major uh, ally of the apartheid regime. Um, the uh, apartheid regime supplied the Israeli government from 48 onwards with arms um, to fight the Palestinians. And later, as the, Palest as the Israeli arms industry increased, they sold arms to uh, South Africa. All of that was common knowledge among South Africans, South Africans. And then, I mean, uh, TV was introduced in South Africa much later, in 1974, 75. And then, of course, we could actually access some of the things that were happening inside um, Palestine. <coughs> Subsequent to that, mm -hmm. a number of political and trade union leaders went from South Africa to Palestine. At the time when the call for the boycott wasn't that uh, 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 widespread, and at the time when the Israelis were still willing to let other people in so that, in the words of the Israelis, they could see the true face of uh, Israel. You know, oppressors always think they live in their own cuckoo land where they think that their, um, that their place, if you just watch what we're really doing, uh, you'll see how humane we really are. And, and. Mm -hmm. So every single South African political leader, with one exception, Chief Mangasutu Butelezi, who was the leader of a, an apartheid tribal homeland at that time. But every single black person that went from South Africa came back from Palestine and Israel saying, gosh, man, 
this is much worse than life had ever been under apartheid. Mm -hmm. One of our trade union leaders, um, um, one of our trade union leaders said that apartheid Israel is a Sunday school picnic compared to what we underwent in, uh, under apartheid. And so the solidarity movement grew. Exactly. Um, and, our... and, and also, sir, upon his visit to Al-Quds, late South African Nobel Prize winner Archbishop Desmond Tutu uh, said on the Israeli appetite, quote, I've been very deeply distressed in my visit to the Holy Land. It reminded me so much of what happened to us black people in South Africa today as you said, as we commemorate 75 years to the Nakba, are Israel's past and present horrendous practices and atrocities to be compared to South African appetite? You know, more than 10, 12 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I went to Palestine. And um, I went to speak at a Sabil conference, perhaps 15 years ago. And at the immigration, when I arrived there, they asked me, what am I doing? So I said, I am coming to speak at a conference. Mm -hmm. What? So I said, I'm coming to speak at the Sabine conference. And they said, about what? So I said, oh, well, I'm coming to speak about Israel um, and is it an apartheid state. So the guy asked me, what are you going to be, what is your position on it? I said, look, first, I'm not uh, used to being asked uh, questions about this before I come. I mean, I'm a free citizen, and I don't think you've got the right to ask me about what my position on this and that question is. But if you really have to know, I don't agree with that statement that apartheid is akin, that, that Israel is akin to apartheid South Africa. So he wanted to smile, and just before he smiled, I said, well, my position is that it's much worse than apartheid South Africa. So that has been my position then. Since then, I've become more and more aware of, um, of how much more insidious, how much more cruel apartheid Israel is. Mm -hmm. Let me give you just one example. Please. You know, the, the, un the underpinning logic of, South Af of white South Africa, it was never to wish away black South Africans. Never. Mm -hmm. White South Africans always knew that they had to find some kind of accommodation with these black South Africans. The logic of Zionism mm -hmm. that, this, that this land is for Jews all over the world, and Jews all over the world must be dragged, must be invited, must be cajoled, must be bribed, to come here and live here. That logic means that the population that is there, the Palestinian population, that they have to be eased out. Mm -hmm. you, can't have, you can't have your basis ideology make space for all of these Jews across the world without asking the question, what happens to the people who live here? The indigenous and people, so then, true. They know what must happen to these indigenous people. They must be spirited away. They must be ethnic cleansed. Their homes and their fields must be destroyed. So the logic of the logic of ethnic cleansing, the the logic of genocide and the elimination of an entire people in their history. It is a logic that is inherently tied to Zionism. Very and true. This is why, unfortunately, but this is unfortunately why there is absolutely no solution to the problem of Zionism, mm -hmm. except that it must be ended. The only path to confront Israeli Zionism and appetite is through resistance and more and more resistance in all its facets. Now, Minister of International Relations Nelly D. Pandor of South Africa notes on the international community double measures and double standards in the case of Ukraine and Palestine. She uh, says the sovereignty was important in the case of Ukraine invasion, but was never important for Palestine. 
the international community is using the framework Look, of international you know, law. Our, our minister, who, by the way, is... Yes, is looking at... They are using international law unequally depending on who's affected by that law. And that must change, sir. As a human rights defender, what is your revision and vision to revise and amend the international multilateral system to ensure it becomes fairer and on equal terms and distance to the oppressed, the disenfranchised, and the occupied peoples? Well, the one is the line that Minister Pandor has gone and how she has articulated the, um, the horror of this uh, one state hegemony all over the world. And when they decide that the pain of other white people is a real pain, that the occupation of another white people, that that is the occupation that deserves the attention of the whole world. So it's a continuous calling out of those things at an international level. However, <clears throat> what is also quite acquired is the intensification of grassroots solidarity movements, the boycott movement, for example, um, the attempts to make Israel a pariah state. Um, in international relations um, at the ground level, the attempts, for example, to uh, change uh, one of the major streets in South Africa uh, and change the name to Leila, Leila Khalid uh, Drive. Uh, Leila Khalid Drive. And by the way, this is also the road that hosts the, uh, the Israeli Chamber of Commerce um, in the center of uh, Johannesburg. So at both international work uh, that is required, but also at an ordinary grassroots level, grassroots level, the awareness creation, the mobilization of people. You know, with South Africa in the apartheid era, we didn't have international country support. I mean, countries like Great Britain, countries like Germany, um, the United States, uh, much of the global north, certainly the United Kingdom, uh, they supported the apartheid regime. We should not forget that, you know, until six years after Mandela was the president of the country of South Africa, he was still on the United States' terrorist list. So <clears throat> we must not forget that never these countries have supported us, but it was ordinary communities in those countries that formed part of anti-apartheid movements, that boycotted South African flowers, South African oranges, um, that protested and made government that led to the change uh, um, in uh, attitudes toward the South African apartheid. And we can see this throughout the world now in Germany, in Sweden, in South Africa, in many parts of the United States, mm -hmm. that increasingly Palestinians and people in solidarity with them, they're turning the heat onto uh, Israel and its allies. Right. And so I think that is the, that is the way for it to go. Just one, you know, in, 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 South Africa, in South Africa, we never actually knew when our freedom would come. Mm -hmm. We had the slogan, freedom or death, victory is certain. And the other slogan that we had was freedom in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, we never with our heads believed that freedom would come in our life. It was a slogan that we held in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And so often with the Palestinian people, it sometimes appears difficult to see, um, you know, in the words of the Quran, When is the help of Allah going to come? When, you know, when is there an end to all of this? Mm -hmm. So it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate question. Hopefully, that they must have hopefully, very, very soon we will leave it there. Professor... <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Professor Farid Isaac, illustrious South African Muslim scholar and BDS South Africa chair. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your exquisite perspective. Lovely talking to you always. السلام عليكم. وعليكم السلام. إذا يمثل فريد إسحاق حركة تضامن يسارية 
في الجنوب العالمي وحركة فهم ديمقراطي وتعددي للإسلام الذي هو ضد التطرف والأصولية والعنف لا يقبل إسحاق أن تبقى مقارنته للوضع الحالي في إسرائيل مع الوضع في جنوب أفريقيا خلال حقبة الفصل العنصري غير معروفة وجلية وبارزة هو يجزم بأن في الواقع الوضع أسوأ بكثير في الأراضي المحتلة ولعل قادة بارزين آخرين في جنوب أفريقيا مثل نيلسون مانديلا والأسقف دازمون توتو نددوا بوحشية ممارسات الاحتلال في فلسطين المحتلة بطريقة حادة مماثلة قد يقال لقد تم القضاء على نظام الفصل العنصري في جنوب أفريقيا ولكن هل تم استئصال هذه النزعة من نفوس من بقوا من هذا النظام البائد هناك ومن ممارساتهم حتى اليوم وهل حقا انتزع المواطنون في جنوب أفريقيا حقهم من المستعمر من كل الميادين سلاما وتحية في مانلا